Uh, we would like to invite, first of all, to our webinar, uh, the, the Faculty of Economics and Administrative Sciences uh, webinar this semester, fall semester 2020-2021. Uh, even it's the first event uh, for all of us this semester. And uh, on behalf of three uh, departments of our faculty, uh, Department of International Relations, Department of Political Science, and Department of Public Administration, uh, we would like to welcome you all uh, today's webinar. Um, and I would like to uh, invite, uh, I would like to give the floor to our distinguished guests. Uh, and before actually I invite her to talk, to give her speech, uh, I would like to give an introductory note with regard to her CV. Um, Associate Professor Dr. Nergis Janefe is now um, a lecturer uh, in the University of York in Canada. She had a PhD in law, uh, and then she has uh, one more PhD in, uh, in social and political thoughts. Uh, she has a master's degree in Department of Sociology, uh, at the same time, she is a graduate of Bozici University from the Department of Sociology. Uh, she actually, there are so many details when you uh, have a look to her uh, CV, uh, but she's uh, very well known uh, in the areas of minorities, nationalism, uh, migration, refugees. Uh, and then, uh, for instance, she wrote on religion and politics in diaspora. Uh, she also worked on refugees in the Middle East, uh, and she also has publications with regard to uh, Balkan nationalisms uh, and also with regard to Cyprus at the same time, as well as Turkey. So I would like to welcome uh, Nergis Janefe, and I would like to thank her very much for being with us, because we all know that she's very busy. Uh, and then uh, we would like to thank Yes, uh, on behalf of uh, Associate Professor Dr. Said Akshit and also Associate Professor Dr. Dinesh Kanol, and also on behalf of our Dean, Professor Dr. Sherife Eivolu. Yes, Ajam, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to join you, uh, albeit online, given the circumstances, but it's a great opportunity uh, to create a synergy and to share ideas. And <clears throat> as the title of this talk indicates, um, my aim is to explore um, some critical approaches both to teaching and learning in higher education, especially at the graduate level, um, as well as uh, in the general context of uh, academic scholarship and research. So the basic line of investigation I will present today relates to a discussion on the nature of witnessing and in particular ethics of witnessing as it is applied to the work of scholars and academics. And I would like to highlight the possibility of presenting ethics of witnessing both in our research work, in our publications, as well as in the classroom as a form of responsibility that is directly related to our positionality in society as scholars and researchers. In addition to that, I'd like to shed light on some of the ways in pedagogical and curricular interventions that we could devise, which could potentially produce a particular kind of practice that encourages engagement on behalf of our students, as well as young scholars, especially as far as I'm concerned in the context of historical trauma, widespread and or state-sponsored and condoned violence, um, issues that are related to criminality and uh, mass political upheaval. In the end, I am working on a project to provide a roadmap of how progressive and engaged pedagogies based on witnessing an ethical form of witnessing um, could possibly motivate us, scholars, researchers, and students to develop an articulate and engaged understanding of affect, um, which would then encourage transformative uh, political responses and processes. So in a sense, what I'd like to share with you today um, is an invitation to bridge the gap between society and academia in a much more direct uh, as well as uh, nuanced and intersectional way. 
Um, so ethics is a form of witnessing um, and witnessing as a form of responsibility in relation to doing scholarly work. Um, it's a it's a it's a process and it's um, a continuation of an effort. It's not a one time happening, um, and and therefore I actually. Um, write on ethics of witnessing as a method and method as intervention in societal and political processes. When we look at um, the way critical engagement has been happening in academia in the last decade or so, certainly there are certain very pronounced approaches that emerge. Uh, one of them is obviously critical ethnography, um, legal ethnography, action research, uh, methods of relational comparison. Um, as of late, um, the, the, the most recent addition to this discussion, ethics of care um, via scholarship, all of these intend to provide tools for reconfiguring um, the engagement um, between academia and um, larger life and, and social and political processes. However, I believe none of them necessarily acknowledge the power-laden processes of constitution of subjects um, as, as well as in my particular area, displacement, dispossession, uh, criminality. Um, and therefore, they tend to present a, a neutralized a schema and a neutralized matrix as far as our subjects are concerned when we engage in research and publication. So one of the core tenets of what I'm proposing as ethics of witnessing as responsibility is also for us to ask ourselves questions as to what image of society we entertain in our minds? What is our understanding of history? What do we refer to, if we refer to at all, um, when we discuss class, where do we locate these? How do we define subjectivity? What is our relationship with human will? Um, do we expect transformation and uh, progression, or do we expect uh, a more catastrophic scenario in the long run? Because not all of us have to be uh, engaged in um, hopeful social change. Uh, we have to, first and foremost, be honest with ourselves as scholars and students as to how do we relate to life and society. I think there has been um, a, a grave mistake for the last hundred years or so um, in the sense that in the name of um, scientific scholarship, especially in social sciences, humanities and legal scholarship, there has been a very sharp division between where we stand, not just our positionality in terms of our class position, ethno racial position or, or gender position, but our positionality as human subjects and, and willful subjects who actually has a mandate in terms of our thoughts and our engagement with society. So we have been intentionally stripping our engagement function um, with society at large from our scholarship as part of our training. Um, as a, a form of neutralizing and therefore scientific, scientification of our research and, and, and findings. So I'm not suggesting that we go into our research and scholarship with a certain political agenda and uh, basically use the university as a platform um, to, to um, <clears throat> engage and convince the crowds um, that are captive because they're in the classroom and or the expert community uh, of our political opinion. That's not what my suggestion is at all. However, I'm really encouraging, especially when we teach and when we supervise, as well as when we write and produce, um, a sharper awareness of where we are standing in terms of the phenomena that we are analyzing. And where does that phenomena then stand and how is it situated in a global context, both histori historically and politically and geographically? And therefore, it's almost a form of awareness, a constant form of awareness, which can um, at times be very painful. Um, and I will give some examples as to why this awareness could be painful, because 
um, awareness is the first step towards adequate witnessing of what's happening and documenting and analyzing and asking questions about what's happening and the implications of what's happening or what has happened. And so in so many ways, what I'm presenting as an option, as a method of intervention or method as intervention is also a form of acknowledging our own function and power in society as scholars, researchers, writers, as opposed to simply being rank and file in the university and um, sort of foot soldiers of knowledge, knowledge mobilization within an institutional setting. I think scholarship historically had a much uh, more powerful role to play. And I think we are realizing that in so many ways, especially when we are needed and our opinion and our knowledge is needed, um, there is certainly a space available for us to introduce our ideas and our knowledge and our synthesis and analysis and, and sometimes um, our severe critique, if necessary, to the ongoing conversation in the society and politics at large. And that includes, by the way, international as local and, and, and regional happenings. So I think it also empowers us as scholars and students in terms of what we're doing and why we're spending decades doing what we're doing um, and what happens to our research. Now, there is a second part of what I'm suggesting, which I will only touch briefly uh, today, touch upon briefly because that uh, refers to our methods of engagement with the public. Um, since the liberalization and neoliberalization of the university, um, almost like a knowledge production uh, machinery and uh, fabrication of various criteria in terms of how a scholar is deemed to be successful, and uh, I think uh, we all know what I'm referring to, uh, which is the numerical value of the journals we publish and how much and how many. Um, I'm not denying the importance of the um, <clears throat> dissemination of knowledge uh, through the expert channels, which are only or primarily used among scholars, which is what academic journals are. Um, people on the street do not read them. Our students even have great difficulty understanding the kind of elaborate and, and um, ornate language we use sometimes, which is necessary um, because it's um, an insider conversation. Nonetheless, I also take great umbrage in terms of limitations of scholarship to that particular venue, so to speak, and publication of our ideas and dissemination of the information and knowledge that we produce only within academic circles. And so in my larger work, as well as at my university level work, I strongly encourage the scholar as a public intellectual. We have a responsibility to the society through our training, through our engagement, through our expertise to provide not just opinion, but guidance and insight and background and different degrees of engagement. I think it is a, an essential part of who we are as scholars and that has been so for the last 2000 years for some uh, reason um, that potential of, of public engagement of scholarship has been eradicated um, gradually and, 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 and quite knowingly by the confinement of the scholar within the four walls of the university, both in the classroom and, and in the administration, and cutting of the ties between the scholar and the society at large to such a degree that we began to talk only among ourselves. And what I'm suggesting as ethics of witnessing as responsibility is that we, we shake that, that conditionality and actually remember what a scholar was in the medieval ages, in different religions, in, 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 the, in modern times, early modern times, in different geographies, um, and a certain kind of a critical wisdom that scholarship can introduce to any um, important debate or conflict um, or question in the society and for us to resume our uh, rightful place in terms of um, providing public presence and 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 that also includes uh, the responsibility 
to publish um, in other means, uh, in other media, um, not to turn down invitations uh, to give public lectures. If you are invited to small communities to discuss their matters, um, not to think of it as a lower degree presence as opposed to an international conference, really be present in the university and outside in terms of what we declare to know, what we declare to specialize in. So um, one of the issues about witnessing, and witnessing is a very peculiar word choice in terms of what we're doing, because often we understand what we're doing as analyzing, synthesizing, coming up with new forms of knowledge, uh, um, production, and uh, new frames of understanding. And so it could be taken as a pejorative term, because witnessing primarily indicates that something is happening, and then you take note of it. And uh, it's like the old script, uh, <clears throat> Ezra in, in, in Old Testament, you write down um, the, the event um, in a way carrying the responsibility of, of um, somehow um, securing the, 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 the details of the happening so that in later times in history, it could be referred to. So that, that's a very, very crippled understanding of witnessing as far as I'm concerned. And as I'll get into in a few minutes, witnessing has a much more uh, um, and detailed and in-depth understanding of social happenings and the perfect witness um, as far as um, war studies and, and international criminal law is concerned, is the dead one. Because only the, the ones who die at the end of atrocities really know what has happened. So in a way, all of us are, as survivors, as people who come into the scene from outside, secondary and tertiary witnesses. We are never a direct witness. The one, direct witness is the one who's actually experiencing what's happening. So in that sense, witnessing already comes with the responsibility that something has happened. You and I were lucky enough not to be the subjects of that happening, um, assuming that it is not necessarily a happy ending. And, and most of the social uh, and political transformations in, include conflict and, and violence and, and um, um, various degrees of um, um, upheaval. And therefore, we arrive to the scene uh, as someone who, who was protected from those circumstances um, by being alive, by being able to write and record, and then also by institutionally by being institutionally protected in terms of what we're producing and then what we can analyze. So witnessing is never a straightforward act. Witnessing includes a certain position of uh, privilege just by virtue of, of, of not being affected by the detrimental aspects of what's happening. And witnessing also has a very, very strong ethical component because there is no such thing as straight recording of events. Um, every time we actually witness and we analyze and we get involved with other people's lives, even in our own society, never mind someone else's society, or historical happenings based on archival documents and testimonies, we are introducing our understanding, our take, or our scholarly community's understanding and take to the events that are happening. So we are already becoming an actor, we are already becoming a party to the conversation. So most of the recent work on ethics of care and research, especially in the context of um, <clears throat> forced migration, dispossession, and upheaval, for instance, talks about accepting the fact that by being there on the on the grounds of a refugee camp, by being there in a detention center, by eliciting that information, by circulating it, you already are becoming a party to it. You cannot cleanse your position from what you're doing in these situations. You are actually an actor. So once you acknowledge that very difficult fact that there is no ivory tower for scholarship, scholarship is itself engagement, especially in the fields that we're working in, in social sciences, humanities and law, but also in medical sciences. Once we accept that sheer fact that we are actually an actor, although the way that we operate is, is quite different because we're not a political actor, but we are a very key a part of the societal uh, conception of knowledge, production, re 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 reproduction of knowledge, circulation of knowledge. Um, and therefore, uh, we have to assume that as a responsibility. And the ethics of witnessing 
um, refers to that very moment of assuming that responsibility. How do we assume that? Do we normalize what's happening? Do we present it as something that cannot change? Do we oversee certain aspects of what's happening and therefore create an image um, that silences certain populations? Do we put too much emphasis on one or another group at the expense of others and therefore create a, perhaps a skewed political agency? Every word that we utter has power and our pen is our weapon, so to speak. This is a very old adage um, that refers to journalism, but I truly believe that it also applies to um, scholars and especially uh, scholars who act in the capacity of public um, experts and, and intellectuals. And therefore there is an ethical engagement every time we witness, we analyze, we document, then we produce and circulate, especially so if it is on subjects that are affecting the entire society and we are actors of our times and we do influence the events that are happening. That is not the aggrandizement of our role as scholarship, but um, <clears throat> often I tell my students that in a given year, in a good year, I get to be with um, somewhere between uh, 500 to 1,000 young people. And we spend extended periods of time discussing politics, history, law. And I am sitting there in the position of authority, not just because I grade papers and the insight that they should be doing, but because I stand there as an expert, as a person who's trained in that field. And if they are going to question my opinion, they have to do so with the full knowledge that I will challenge their sources and I will invite them to be as clear as possible in terms of their understanding of social phenomena, political phenomena, legal phenomena. And therefore, it's a very informed form of conversation. It's not the coffee house conversation. And in that sense, <clears throat> even just by virtue of being in the classroom and training generation after generation of young scholars, and I've been working as a scholar in different universities in different parts of the world, close to 20 years. So in my limited, very meager capacity as this tiny woman from the Middle East, I got to talk to and share my ideas about very critical subjects with at least 20,000 people. And that's just the classroom experience. And therefore, to think that the scholar has only limited effect in terms of where they stand is really minimizing their statute. They are actually interlocutors in the society. And as we, many of us know, when we are teaching critical subjects related to conflict, for instance, international, local, regional, otherwise, we often have members of different groups who are a party to an ongoing conflict in our classrooms. So we actually have a mini universe of what's happening outside, inside our classroom. And one by one, we strive to make those individuals, young people or <clears throat> adult students, and I have special place for adult students in my heart, by the way, because I think it's really, really important to think of education as a lifelong endeavor as opposed to something that ends at 25. I don't believe in that. And I, I make great effort in terms of taking part in adult education programs and special MAs and, and returning PhD students, etc. This is just a side note, but it's also part of my understanding that this job that we do as scholars and the ethics of and the responsibility of what we're doing cannot be limited to under 25 year olds who are there to get a degree, to get a job. We have a much larger um, <clears throat> call in terms of what we're doing, what we're writing on, what we're sharing um, with the public at large. So, I mean, to summarize uh, what I'm inviting people to think about, and this is in writing form, and today I'm very lucky to share it with you in, in, in a verbal form, um, it is to take a deliberate stance um, against uh, certain reigning patterns uh, marking existing social, political, legal order, especially if it has a violent component, and, um, and, 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 and to embrace our own understanding of what we expect from justice and, and, and use our 
uh, expert opinion and knowledge um, to to reinforce um, a, a, a certain kind of uh, um, set of practices um, that are really addressing the needs of the society uh, uh, at the time as we see fit in the sense that we do make choices in terms of what we're studying, what we're teaching. Um, and what I'm inviting us to do is to be more aware and more articulate about those choices and not to apologize about the choices we make. Because if we are comfortable about our positionality and we think of ourselves as public actors as well as institutionally responsible um, servants of the society and educational establishment, it's a dual role then we don't need to be uh, apologetic. So one of the things that I'm going to <clears throat> talk about is yesterday I was actually giving a training uh, with the, the UN offices um, and I had about 31, 32 bureaucrats that I was training the whole day. And the kinds of examples I was uh, bringing in from international law um, because the issue was uh, practices of statelessness and how, how states engage with these practices. I was pulling the, 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 the practitioners in the front line. This is what they, they were. They were they were high level bureaucrats. I was pulling them into the discussion because I needed to know what they were doing so that I can actually respond with possible solutions and alternative approaches to what they were doing. That's a strict engagement. Now I had the choice. I could have just taught them the <clears throat> the letter of the law and international covenants and then the language of of of, of certain uh, conventions and and basically leave the room like that saying learn this these are the guidelines these are the high principles or i could have chosen to really get my hands dirty so to speak and look into what exactly they were doing the kinds of practices they were engaging as they were sitting at border areas, making day-to-day -day decisions about who to detain, who to expel, who to, to actually um, accommodate in terms of rights and citizenship, and have a really engaged, but for me, very difficult conversation. Because this also, um, in a way, challenges the limits of my own knowledge. I cannot know everything in that field. So I have to be very, very invested in trying to understand how they operate, what's the framework within which they operate, rather than being point blank critical or appraising what they're doing, having a genuine dialogue as to what could be done, what could be done under such circumstances, what's done under such circumstances, let's say in Lebanon, or what was the historical practice in South Africa? How do Canadians actually engage with labor market needs? Bringing in different examples and creating a synergy um, in that limited time period of six hours or so that I was training these people. And at the end of the day, I always look at the responses of these um, uh, participants. And if they say um, things like, you know, this training session or this engagement really made me rethink or it actually brought new questions to my mind or if they tell me can i contact you later because there's this thing i'm dealing with i feel that okay i've done my job maybe not the best but it is much better than receiving a thank you very much, Professor so-and-so. You really enlightened us with your endless knowledge of international law. And thank you, part participants. When people are troubled, when people are confused, when people have questions that they want to ask more, when people go back to what they think they know and reframe what they think they know, that's when I think we are really performing our function as scholars and researchers, because that means the public interface is really taking place. And that's what I'm referring to as ethics of witnessing. We have an ethical responsibility, not just to witness, but also to engage and to disseminate what we see, what we understand, what we analyze by naming names and by contextualizing it in such a way that both in the classroom and outside, it could actually enter into the larger conversation about social and political world, change, um, peace, war, conflict, transformation, whatever your subject matter is. Um, so, 
the the text that I'm working on is fairly lengthy, uh, but I'm also uh, working uh, with a graduate student of mine to uh, create um, an open source website. Uh, I've done something similar with the Syrian Exodus, um, which is now used at law schools. It's an interactive site. Um, uh, it will be housed by York University and will be accessed uh, internationally without a fee. And the reason why it could be housed by an institution, or it should be, as far as I'm concerned, is that way is protected and it's archived. Um, in this digital age of ours, it's so easy to create webinars and websites. And let me tell you, in five years down the road, most of, will, of, of them will disappear. And it will be very difficult to create a track record of what we're doing right now, especially verbally or through web. And therefore, one of the things I hope to do is create, creating a continuity um, in terms of um, engaged scholarship. And as far as I'm concerned, put my expertise down as an open public resource that could be reached in internationally um, <clears throat> with both academic resources and best practices and institutions that engage this kind of um, in, in this kind of debate and, and put it out there. And, and that is also another part of, of what I suggest that we do in scholarship. And uh, also perhaps academically, we change uh, some of the criteria that we evaluate uh, scholarship in the sense that public presence, direct public engagement of scholars takes so much effort, energy, understanding, knowledge, and courage. Because in so many ways, university is a safe, safer environment. In your own department, likely you may be the only person who has expert opinion on that subject, and you teach your own courses. So who's going to challenge what you're suggesting States, right? If you publish, surely you enter a different kind of conversation and you can join other experts in your field. But within your home institution, it's a very safe, safe environment. By opening up to the public, you're actually rendering yourself vulnerable. And I believe that is a very, very valuable form of vulnerability. We need that kind of vulnerability. We need to be able to counter questions, concerns, sometimes outcries. Sometimes um, <clears throat> the kinds of responses we rather not have from the public in terms of what we think about current or past events and, and uh, our interpretation of what needs to be done. Because at the end of the day, in the classroom, whether we accept it or not, we do engage with certain degree of prescription as to how we think our students should understand things and how we think they should analyze uh, future developments, how we think they should entertain a certain theoretical take. We do prescribe. So what I'm suggesting is, in the larger context, we should not shy away from sharing our prescriptions and our understanding and our take and stand very firm um, with those inclinations and dedications and investments that we built over years. Typical training <clears throat> of a good, uh, um, um, good standing scholar is about 30 years. It's actually longer than uh, a specialized doctor, right? It's a very, very long training period. Um, and obviously it includes <clears throat> um, university education, higher education, um, postdoc, um, internships, all the rest. So by the time we mature, usually uh, we have spent about 30 years studying the same subject. So we actually have the right to stand by the prescriptions, if it is a prescription that we are putting on the table, because we can explain and we can we can add to the conversation that's happening in the public in terms of those years of understanding and mulling over and unpacking and repacking and undoing and redoing what we specialized in. So. One of the things um, that really hinders that kind of openness uh, and uh, the possible interface between the public and the university um, <clears throat> is there are certain social and political vested interests um, in many of the social and political relationships in the society um, that include the university. So the understanding is that what is produced and reproduced and disseminated within the confines of the university has to be presumed as pleasing to all sectors of the society, as neutral, as, 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 as straightforward as possible, and it should not create meaning environments that are conflictual. 
But what if you are living in a society where there is already conflictual understandings of things? What this tension and disagreement um, are essential parts of a living democracy? What if debate more than conversation and the, 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 the desire and also the necessity to convince the other party as an essential part of social and political life? What if you need a legal system that responds to changing public needs? And in that case, if you assume a position that's neutral and static and dormant, what you're doing is you're actually going against society. You're not going with society, but you're going against it. So you have to have, as the old saying goes, your ear on the train tracks. And you really need to know. One of the things that I started doing when I was very young was, <clears throat> I know the choice is not the best, but certainly um, on a very regular basis, read both national and international news. And to this day, I have a story to share with you. Um, <clears throat> wherever I am, um, I continue to buy print newspapers. Uh, it's an, It's a... It's um, uh, how shall we say a very stubborn attitude of mine. Everything is on internet, but but nonetheless, um, and I always buy the spectrum. So I buy <clears throat> to the left, the medium, and to the right. And on the same issue, I actually sit down and read the the, the whole palette of how the same uh, conversation is taking place, albeit with different reference different reference points and. Um, how it's actually framed uh, in different contexts. So one of the things that I do when I enter the classroom in terms of critical human rights law, I ask my students, and we are usually together for six months because of full year training. I ask them that the first condition to be in this classroom is that I want them to start reading news at least twice a week. And they say, what news? And I say, first of all, international. Find yourself an international outlet. I need you to, to bring out the world map and <clears throat> check out the countries that you can actually locate and realize how many of them you don't even know. And, and I say, this is not to incriminate you, but this is to know what we don't know. And then start reading news about the countries that we know nothing about. Because most of us has regional maps uh, cognitively, but we don't uh, have an awareness of, let's say, what's happening in Latin America, which countries are there, um, what is their historical uh, turning points if we did not study it or if we have no engagement person or otherwise with that continent. And therefore, the first step for me in the classroom environment when we're discussing critical international law is that know your globe. Know when countries were established, who is neighbor to whom. The next step is tell me where are the active ongoing wars right now, how many, and check those out. And so it's awareness raising, it's an engagement, it's not just region, uh, teaching the scholarly information, but it's also making people, especially young people, to stop, think, look around, and look again at the world, realizing that in the crazy rush of getting a degree, and especially if they're international scholars, managing to stay in a different country, finding a job afterwards, who knows what else? In that crazy rush, there's that moment of thinking why they are there, why they are taking these courses. What is it that is to remain with them when they finished with their degree courses? Because at the end of the day, what will remain with them will make them the person that they will become. It's not just the theoretical information we're sharing, but it's the way of looking. It's the, the power of engagement that we're enforcing for them to appropriate in a classroom environment or outside. So in that context, one of the things that I've been really keen on is what's called um, <clears throat> experiential education. And um, I mean, it, it has a, a, a sort of a bad name associated with it in the sense that some people see it as professors um, using their class time to send their students out there to whomever they know personally, um, supposedly doing some internship work um, and, and, and therefore diluting the knowledge environment. 
That's not what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is, let's say, encouraging them to create a documentary footage. I mean, this generation is very, very at home with all forms of technology, and they can do many a thing you and I, our generation, really need training for. They can do it in their sleep. But the idea is to really get them engaged as members of the public. Our smaller public is the university, larger public is the society we live in, and then there's a much larger public, um, which is the global society, if there is one. And to create them uh, in them the sense that they belong, they actually matter, they actually have something to say. It's not just I am teaching them what to think about, but at the end of that dialogue or interchange with me, they have their own opinions, their interpretation, and they can bring something back to that conversation. And so experiential education in that sense, I think, is a very important part of critical pedagogies of teaching and learning and knowledge, knowledge dissemination, because it also puts them into that position of moving in and out of university and the larger life. University is part of life, and therefore I'm not saying university and life. I'm saying larger life or larger society. And that in and out movement is really, really essential. So just as I'm encouraging scholars <clears throat> like myself, younger scholars, researchers, to really, really engage with the public um, and, and articulate their positionality as a form of ethical engagement. Um, it's really important to use the classroom environment um, for building the capacity for agency for our students to engage, to ask questions, try to answer some of them, come up with solutions on their own behalf. Why should it be the case as, a, as professors we should know all the answers? Do we? I don't think so. I certainly don't. There are questions I can't answer. And frankly, some of these questions belong to the next generation because I'll be long buried by the time the full scale of any disasters hit this old globe of ours, right? It's the next generation that has to solve them. I can come up with ideas about root causes, about environmental refugees, climate disasters, Anthropocene. I can create a, a, a milieu of understanding of how these things happened and possible solutions in the long term. But at the end of the day, I'll be long gone by the time they have to do something about it. It's them who has to come up with very practical and applicable solutions to the problems that are affecting their times. Or it's them who will have to address different waves of forced migration and war and conflict and displacement. I can certainly teach about the Syrian exodus and Middle Eastern states, but the children of Syrian refugees today are the ones who might eventually go back or establish and reestablish themselves in the new societies that they're hosted in and tell that story. I can only start the beginning of it and create an awareness, but they are the ones who will complete. So part of the ethics of witnessing and responsibility, pedagogical responsibility, is to acknowledge the current and potential future agency of our interlocutors. In this case, our interlocutors are our students or the people that we train. I am using the term student in a larger context. So for instance, I'm a student of law. Am I? Am I a student anymore? I am always a student as long as I'm willing to learn something new. I'm always a student as long as I'm opening myself to new possibilities of explaining and understanding. So the student as a status in a university is a very minute portion of what it means to be a student. So anyone who's a student of a particular area of learning, um, first and foremost, engages with that practice because they're using their agency, their will, to have an effect, at least to understand what's happening around them. So it's a form of awareness building as well as engagement. And I think we should openly acknowledge that in our classrooms, in our institutions, as well as in our engagements with the public. And we should really be open to at least listening very difficult questions asked to us, expecting an answer. And one of the things I've learned um, <clears throat> over the years is that although I may not know the answer 
and many a time I may not know the specific answer, but I can definitely work hard to come up with a possible approach to that problem. And it's my responsibility to, to share that rather than claiming this is not my expert area. I'm not suggesting we should venture into areas where we do not have expertise, but if there are historically specific or politically brittle questions that are for forwarded to us, I don't think we should secure ourselves immediately and disengage from the conversation thinking, you know what, this, this is just too tangled or this is too edgy or this is too political. I think we have the power and the training and also the responsibility to reframe that question, to introduce further possibilities of discussion and conversation rather than taking a side. But we can certainly engage. Um, <clears throat> and I've learned that um, through um, television broadcasting programs and roundtables that I was invited. Um, I mean, at first, my stance was, I think, maybe 10, 15 years ago, a little bit more rigid. I had a point to make, and that's what I knew, and I was very certain of what I knew, and there were other people that were there to make their points. And later on, I realized, you know what? That's not the point of being there. The round table is actually a fight, a fight of ideas, not a fight in the negative sense, but a fight in, this, in the sense of I present one opinion, someone else, usually a good round table brings together people of opposing opinions. And if you're just saying, no, this is the way and only repeating that, you're not engaging. You have to engage and open up and try to understand the positionality of the opposing view and then reframe your question. The key is engagement. And then that's why I'm talking about witnessing research as an ethical responsibility, you have to be open to engagement at all times. You cannot hide away um, <clears throat> behind the, the barricade of our scholarly um, publications and books from European academic presses, because it, those are very effective ways of making a name for ourselves and perhaps making a contribution to the fields. But do the people on the street read them? Do our students even read them unless we buy chapters and photocopy? They are mostly un, un, unaffordable. Academic publishing is at, at such a level that it's almost like the fashion industry. The hardcover books are only published for university libraries. And library books are only used if a, if a professor applies a certain chapter to their, to their curriculum. And therefore, if we think our only or main form of engagement with the public at large um, <clears throat> is through scholarly publication in written word, then I think we are really doing ourselves and the society a disservice. We have to be living examples of the ability to debate, to ask questions, to seek answers, to reframe existing phenomena, uh, to introduce new approaches, sometimes to talk about things people don't want to talk about, sometimes to talk about things bring up subjects that are forgotten. Not that we know where that is going to lead us in terms of a journey, but at least to introduce that element to the existing conversation. And those are very hard tasks. They're actually much harder than being in the classroom. Not labor-wise, but it makes you visible. It makes you vulnerable. And it makes you questionable. One of the reasons why people often go back to university for doing a second or a third degree, as I've done myself after becoming tenured, um, is for once you want to stop being the professor. For once you want to be able to ask questions and not know the answers. And I think that's an ability we should not lose because most of the phenomena that we're dealing with, especially if it includes political violence, conflict, um, and 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 long-term mass criminality forms of mass criminality. What I mean by that is, if you're studying genocide or ethnic cleansing, it's certainly not the act of one or two people, but it has a very strong societal dimension. Often, you don't know what you're looking at. You hope to know. You hope to understand. You're trying to make sense. But you're really looking at the underbelly of humanity. I'm only looking at my own subject matter, um, my specialty. And, and in that case, for you to assume you know what's happening and why people have done what they've done um, is an illusion. You cannot know. They themselves often don't know what has happened exactly at that moment in that mass frenzy where there's uh, massive killings and displacement and dispossessions and, and then history is rewritten. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a moment of chaos. So one has to always carry the humbleness of uh, accepting the fact that even you and I, 
who might have specialized 30, 40, 50 years in that subject, will not know everything that needs to be known or shared, even in that minute portion of that moment of history or current events. But we certainly will have insight. We'll have insight and expertise, and we'll have a certain tone, not intellectual, but also um, in so many ways, um, I don't want to say spiritual, but as a form of engagement, we are not a party to any of the fractions that are that have stakes in the uncovering of the events, not a direct party. And if we are a direct party, certainly institutionally, we are not meant to be operating on that line. And yet we can, by that position of stepping just one step aside, being able to witness rather than being, being in the center of it and being directly affected, we can actually have the kind of bird's eye view or the kind of critical perspective that would be needed by many who are right at the center of the storm, in the eye of the storm, and that are affected. And that critical distance is our treasure. So the ability to witness is our treasure. But it's also the kind of resource that has to be used very carefully and very effectively. And if we are not aware, consciously aware of its power and how it can introduce certain ideas or change certain perspectives, and, or how it would affect young generations, um, then we are really doing a disservice to ourselves, to our institutions, and to the society at large who trained and educated us. Um, as a scholar from the Global South, who is uh, fully employed in the Global North, in one of the best institutions in the Global North, I carry my dual identity with pride, because I often say, I teach many an immigrant children, <clears throat> children in the sense that their pa parents are immigrants, they're first generation Canadians, for instance, and al almost all of them speak second, third languages. And I say with pride that I am a product of the global south and the global north. My understanding of life and humanity in my formative years took place in the global south. I'm a product of the Middle East. And so my sharpness, my skills, my interrogative skills, my humor, those are culturally coded. I am what I am from that region. And yet I'm also trained in the best institutions in the global north, so I can speak that language, I can understand that approach, I can really become a part of that conversation as well. And yet that also brings the difficulty of who are you with? Are you with the global north? Are you with the global south? Then the question is, do I have to be with anyone? I am a party to the subjects that I study, I analyze, I write on. I'm a party in the sense that I'm a voice in that conversation. But beyond that, I don't need to claim allegiance to this or that party, this or that institution, this or that geography in the world. And in that sense, you also have the ability to bring comfort, especially if you're teaching in an international setting, and Near East University is a similar venue in that regard, to people who are hailing from different geographies, different backgrounds, bringing in the good news that no matter where you are uh, hailing from, you're coming from, no matter where you're trained, there's a certain common understanding of certain subjects, be it war, be it peace, be it conflict, be it economy, be it institutions, be it international relations. We can actually come up with a common understanding of this, this world that we're living in together. And, and that brings also a, a keener understanding of interconnectivity, not just of countries and continents, but also processes and phenomena. And that, I think, is a very important part of the witnessing the responsibility that we have to, to bring down the, the, the barriers that actually isolate, especially the younger generation, the next generation, in their helplessness, in their search. Many of them come from conflict zones. And many of them often think that they are the only ones who are suffering, who have suffered to that degree. And when, when you explain to them that, no, at the moment, there are so many similar conflicts happening, and these seem to be the root causes, and then these are the examples where the society moved on, and there has been the possibility of uh, 
um, uh, transitional justice, for instance, then the, 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 the light in the classroom changes. You actually see the look in the eyes of your students thinking, huh, you know, we're not the only ones. We're not the only ones who are going through this, who've gone through this. And indeed, there are possible ways of overcoming this or thinking about it in other ways. It's that moment, I, I call it the moment of um, <clears throat> being suspended in air. And I often tell, both in training and in, in classroom, I want you to be confused. Because when you're confused, that's when you're actually learning. That's when you suspend what you already know and allow other kinds of conversations to enter into your own system of thinking. And that's what I mean by responsibility. Actively engaging in asking new questions, actively engaging in people seeing their positionality, contextualizing knowledge that we teach. Um, and the last portion of what I wanna talk about is <clears throat> what do we do with critique? I've worked in institutions who are very steep in critique. I've, 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 I was trained in institutions who had critiques of um, global economy, who had critiques of uh, historical trends. I was trained with people who only excelled in critique and critical methodologies. And as I became one on my own, one of the things I realized was as I was parting with this um, <clears throat> sage knowledge, I was making um, my students and young people, not just me, but in general, we were making them rather depressed. As I got older, I realized that I was actually more hopeful than the people that I was teaching, not my own doing, but especially in a critical setting, they felt so oppressed by the histories of oppression. And we were not doing a good enough job to entertain possibilities of transgression, possibilities of coming up with new ways, alternative methods of thinking. And, and I began to teach a graduate course about, I think 12 years ago on politics of utopia. And I singularly sat down and created the syllabus looking at different historical time periods and people who lived through utter misery and destitution and war, who then, dare to imagine something else. And I sat down and, and, and made an architecture of, of uh, in innovative thinking in terms of what do you do when you're really cornered. And then I began to think, well, it's not just one classroom or one course or one book that one should really incorporate that approach. If you're living in difficult times, if one part of our task is to discuss the difficulty of these times, the nature of these difficulties and the causes of these difficulties and the methods of encountering these difficulties so that at least they are disclosed and they're not hidden agendas. Another part of our task and then a balancing part is that, is to produce ideas or at least let our subjects, our interlocutors to think about possible ways of thinking otherwise. And in that sense, utopia is not a literary um, <clears throat> annotation, so to speak, but it is a method again. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of encouraging engagement with not just the hope, and this is really important, but the belief that another way of doing things is possible. Maybe small scale, maybe not word, uh, <clears throat> world government. And um, as someone who teaches international law very regularly in different venues, Often the first thing I have to convince my students, especially young law students, is that there is no such thing as a rigid um, <clears throat> once and for all international legal system. It's actually fractured and it has different levels of engagement and it is heavily contested. Let's start from there. Now the ideal might be one, but it's not there and it has a very, very difficult history, especially for countries in the global south. And if we start from there, then at least it allows us the possibility of thinking other ways of dealing with international law, appropriating it in a more uh, specific purpose that really 
uh, serves our interests, for instance, or rewriting histories, or rereading it, or not just attributing all of its values to this or that an imperialist power, but actually creating an understanding of humanity. So, so one of the important tenets of ethics of uh, witnessing it and and uh, as a form of responsibility and engaged scholarship is really and truly to allow for space intellectual and emotional effective space when we are teaching very difficult subjects uh, for our interlocutors to come up with different ways of imagining a world that is not the way it is right now and does that mean we just kind of give open rein and everybody comes up with uh, most outrageous ideas that do not have any application in the real world no you obviously set confines and you obviously encourage method and informed opinion. And in that sense, uh, one of the <clears throat> uh, most torturous moments for my students when they're learning international law in particular and human rights law is not to be generic. I tell them, no, you're not going to generalize. You're going to be as specific as possible. If you're going to talk about uh, mining industry, extractive industries, and the kind of blood that they extract, in exchange for the valuable materials that they produce. You're not gonna talk specific, generally, you're gonna tell me the country, the, the mining companies, um, <clears throat> the accountability component, the, um, the local mining laws. You're gonna give me the numbers, the dates. Uh, you're gonna tell me who's working there, the last 10, let's say, explosions or mining accidents, government responses. You're gonna really get down to the ground. And then you're going to tell me what could be done, because that's the responsible engagement. And so on the one hand, you infuse hope to imagine a different future. But on the other hand, you actually still really use a very heavy disciplinary hand saying, do it in a way that befits the scholarship that you're, you're exposed to. Do it in an informed way so people know that you know what you're talking about and they can respect what you're saying. Because if you don't, you're just going to be one of those anonymous voices in the public who is not happy with the system. So, I mean, I'm looking at the time. Um, I've already been talking for an hour and I can talk for another three hours, which I will not do in the interest of um, <clears throat> everybody's sanity and patience. There are many, many uh, other aspects of how to deal with vulnerable individuals, groups, classes, communities. Um, um, approaches when you're teaching um, very sensitive subjects that refer to open wounds in the society or um, how to incorporate um, knowledge of current times and political events in a curriculum that is meant to be as neutral as possible um, for the sake of protecting the institution that is the university, which is home to everybody from the society, not just one group or another. And how to talk about taboo subjects, such as the number of disappeared, um, or the number of illegal immigrants, or um, certain policies um, that are referring to institutional practices. So there are many layers of um, <clears throat> how do you do the witnessing? How do you properly do the witnessing that um, that is not the, the common practice in the society? And how do you do it in an informed way so that you're not seen as targeting a particular group, be it the state, be it the particular institution, but as a form of socially engaged scholarship? Um, and in that sense, witnessing also allows you a kind of safe space because sometimes and I'm not suggesting um, in the particular Middle Eastern context, but I worked in South Asia for about a decade. And sometimes as I'm crossing the border, I'm actually questioned because of what I do in general. I'm not questioned in a criminal sense, but nobody likes people who look at forced displacement, disappearances, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so once you're known in a certain field, um, then often there are a few questions asked and, and I cherish those conversations um, at different offices. And I do say point blank that, you know what? I just I just try to see and document. I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm not producing a political agenda or how we deal with it as a society. But my responsibility is to, to, to see, to witness, to, to analyze, to understand, and to record, right? 
So it's a, it's a function of recording. The reason being, often when it's not recorded, and if there's a societal tide towards not acknowledging, not seeing, that leads to not remembering, and, and that often leads to assuming that it never happened. And that leads to very many forms of social and political and economical amnesia, which then allows us to make the same mistakes, to create the same miseries again and again, because we never learn a lesson in the sense that it never gets appropriated by the public at large. It doesn't register in the public memory, the communal memory of where we came from, what are we doing right now? So <clears throat> there's a certain sense of urgency that our work is never done. And often when my children were young, and we used to talk about what does mommy do? Um, mommy talks about um, wars. Mommy talks about gruesome subjects. Mommy talks about um, things that people often don't want to mention in a polite conversation. That's what mommy does day and night. And, and, um, and I used to say, I'm just recording. I'm recording in the sense that, you know, one day when it's needed, at least there'll be something to refer to because if we don't do it, um, then in the great tide of things and immediate needs and political calculations, it will all disappear with us. The whole historical memory would disappear. So one of the things I would like to, to suggest for us to think about is scholarship that is produced regionally is of, 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 of one of the greatest cultural products of a region. So for instance, um, with the dismantling of Syria and Syrian populations, it's not just the Syrian refugees or walking, crossing the borders, drowning in the sea, the millions and millions, that is a great loss to humanity at all. It's also the, the, the writers, the scholars, the artists, the musicians, the, the architects, the, the people who are um, gifted by their society to be in the position of recording and witnessing and carrying the memory forward that Syria has lost because they're dispersed. They're unrooted and uprooted from where they grew grew up and, and where they produced and where they understood. So one of the things that we should really claim the ownership of as an institution, especially um, as a university um, establishment with higher education and graduate education functions is to provide ownership for regional scholarship and really cherish the thinkers and the writers among ourselves that we produced ourselves. So I'm ending in a rather odd note, but what I'm trying to suggest is if we are part of the Middle East, and Cyprus certainly is, then in our curriculum, we really need to make space to read and to teach the ones who grew up from this soil, the ones who were witnesses to what was happening and what is happening on these grounds. And they have their own take because otherwise, what we're doing is we're delegating our responsibility witness and the ethical engagement function to world scholars elsewhere to explain what's happening to us through their own voice. I'm not suggesting we should not include Anglo-American scholarship, French scholarship, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we should be much more keen in creating a platform for the kind of responsible engagement that is emanating from our own region, from our historical context, and really make an effort to teach and to disseminate the works, the thoughts, the interventions of the people who both suffered and survived on these lands. Not because these lands are very, very precious and they're unique in such a way that it won't compare with anywhere else. But because there's a certain rootedness, rootedness in our experiences, which actually renders us genuine witnesses, as opposed to someone who decides to do their PhD and decides to do field work in Cyprus, comes and works for, let's say, a year or two, writes their field report, certainly they'll produce beautiful, informed scholarship. But the degree of engagement they will have with that society will no doubt will be so much more limited than someone 
who actually grew up, let's say, on this island and who really knows the ins and outs of history and has a certain place in the society, certain stake in what's going to happen in the future. And I know what I'm saying sounds awful because it could be read as scholarship only um, <clears throat> belongs to where it emanated from. I am the example um, that is walking around of the opposite in the sense that you can be from the global south but work in the global north. But the reason why I can do that is um, as much as I am capable um, in this you know, limited capacity of mine, I engage with both societies. When I'm in North America, I don't speak there as an outsider. I am actually a part of the conversation there. And I talk with government offices there. I provide training to bureaucrats there. When I come to the Global South, then I'm part of this society. So the key is engagement. And the danger is to honor and to cherish and to give a privileged status to kind of the kind of scholarship that has, quote, unquote, visibility in international press, but does not have the engagement or a, a very vivid sense of um, responsibility to the subject matter that they're covering. So I'm going to end now. And I know I haven't given a break to ask questions. Um, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, invite um, the conveners, uh, perhaps to continue the conversation that I started. Yes. Um... I would like to thank you very much uh, for this in-depth, uh, at the same time, uh, stimulating and insightful talk. Uh, we really enjoyed. Uh, and we also have our colleagues uh, from the, our departments, as well as our students, PhD, masters, and also from our BA programs. So we all would like to thank you. Uh, uh, for, you, for your speech. And it also um, inspired us, uh, especially in terms of thinking about uh, the critical uh, perspective, thinking from a critical perspective that we should go beyond certain limits actually that we have and not taking the things as they are granted or forgiven, but how we can also go beyond and, and also have a more uh, you know, alternative thinking uh spaces actually uh, because uh, most of the time um we also face an academia that uh okay you can produce but what you produce is also very important because at the end of the day you can reproduce what is already existing but the the most important thing of course is going beyond uh, all these limits and at the same time uh, to be responsible to our environment that we actually emanating from uh, and including the global south we all actually uh, emanated from the global south. So there were several questions during your uh, talk, and I would like to um, uh, ask, uh, or let's say, uh, be the uh, the bridge uh, between the audience. Uh, and may I also uh, ask uh, from our, uh, you know, the the technical staff to um, help us to see the question uh, on the screen. There was a question asked by um, Hakan Hoca, Dr. Hakan Karahasan. Can we have the question, please? Yeah. Yes, Hoca, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I mean, um, certainly Sartre's notion of engagement could be one entry point. Um, there are other um, <clears throat> entry points to this particular notion of engagement. And um, there's a certain um, sector in academia known as Holocaust studies, or uh, Second World War studies, memory studies, and then all of these um, subsections, so to speak, of different fields um, engage with, um, I mean, different writers, different uh, theorists. Uh, Lyotard is one, Shoshana Feldman is another. Some groups engage with them, um, some partake in the Gramscian take. So certainly you can do Sartre. Um, but here, again, I would encourage all of us to think of why we are using certain thinkers or why we're attributing special meaning to certain concepts used by these thinkers, contextualize. And, and, and um, for instance, my graduate students would respond to you suggesting why to use Sartre but not Fanon. Why to use Sartre but not Chimney? 
not meme. You know, like why to use a French thinker uh, <clears throat> of, 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 of that particular time rather than someone who actually was exposed to uh, French oppressive strategies and or uh, took part in post-colonial struggles and had a very different form of engagement um, with the establishment, with knowledge production. I'm not suggesting one could not use Sartre, but again, one has to contextualize as to why these notions matter. So it's not the concept itself, but how it's used and how it's um, <clears throat> um, introduced into a larger debate. I hope this helps. Um, in terms of the question. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other question from the audience? Would you, would you like to? Yeah. Would you like to add um, maybe um, the, a, a kind of an overall analysis after today's speech? And hopefully we can also um, have you at the campus again, as we did uh, by the beginning of the semester. Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it feels like a very surreal existence for all of us. As much as Zoom is incredibly creative, uh, it cannot replace the, <clears throat> the, the beauty and the richness of human contact and, and uh, actually seeing people's eyes and faces and, 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 and really being present there. Um, I cannot see the audience here, um, okay. no doubt. What I'm wondering is um, actually, um, do fe people feel pessimistic, especially among our students? Do they feel pessimistic as they learn more and more of the critical approaches to international relations, political economy? Do they feel like, um, the more they understand, the darker the picture looks, or do they feel, what I'm trying to, to elicit is, is my fear that we're not teaching enough of alternative ways, is, is, is it justified? I know in my own institutions, it is justified, because when I do have these conversations, there's a great hunger for thinking of other ways, uh, not just understanding what is wrong, but also what to do beyond that. So I'm just wondering if any of our students would actually venture opin an opinion on this. They are all actually sending their best wishes to you and uh, their special thank. Um, may I also ask, yeah, did Encha Jam and Saita Jam to join us? And we yes. would to, on behalf of our faculty and departments and colleagues and students, we would like to say thank you, a very big thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you. So hope to, to see you in one way or another in the near future. And thank you for hosting me again. And by the way, if uh, you'd like to share the, the contents of the talk, um, <clears throat> I have a short essay that I can share with, or I can, I can share um, a flow chart of some of the ideas and references. If you prefer to do that, just let me know. We will be happy, Hojam. Okay. So, um, Sayyid Hojam, would you like to um, add something then, the intro Hojam, and maybe we can conclude our session today? Nergis Hojam, thank you very much. It's always great to have you. I mean, uh, even though it's an online pr platform, it's very educative. Uh, and uh, actually, I found it very uh, interesting as we are actually going through a, a very strange period uh, in this sense. Not only because of the pandemic, because of the political conditions as well. Because, you know, it's, I found this period not a very easy period for engagement too. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the general public, uh, especially if you're to use, for example, newspapers, uh, as you know, if, uh, the, the statements that you give may be used in different ways. I mean, because they are trying to bring forward some aspect rather than the other, uh, in this sense. So, uh, uh, but of course, on a one-on-one -on -one engagement, it's very important, especially to the students and. Uh, to the, the different groups that we encounter. And uh, of course, they need to uh, search for alternatives, alternative ways of thinking. Uh, and of course, uh, actually better knowing the alternatives if you are even from a mainstream perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Roger. It's always uh, nice to uh, hear your thoughts uh, because you bring some um, uh, outside the box kind of uh, thoughts to us. Um, uh, and in the flowchart, I'm really uh, eager to read this flowchart and ideas that you might summarize your um, presentation. The uh, only thing that maybe um, if we can, you know, ask from you would be uh, there is a problem of, you know, being in the environment like uh, that we are in. And then how can we um, find ways to actually challenge that environment? So uh, you have uh, proposed some um, ideas about how to do that. Uh, but really, like, if you could uh, say uh, two or three things in this uh, flowchart about, you know, how can somebody who is part of the system can, in a way, try to get outside of the system? Because, as you know, you know, it's very hard to do that as being part of the structure and, you know, agencies uh, trying to uh, change the structure. So how, as academics, you know, how can we do that? Uh, so I would be really uh, happy to have some ideas about that, uh, if you can provide that to us. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm going to give a very location-specific answer to your most valuable question. Um, at the very institution that you are situated, um, there is a research institute, the Near East Institute. And my experience has been that <clears throat> some of the research institutes uh, located at universities, uh, which have a semi-independent take on events, semi-independent in the sense that um, they are influenced by the researchers who are at the university, but they don't owe allegiance to any particular political group or party. So by producing reports, uh, opinion pieces, by organizing roundtables, you actually create an alternative space for knowledge production. By producing um, yellow papers or memos that could be circulated among the public servants, by assuming the rightful place of being an expert um, opinion center, you then become an interlocutor. Does that mean you change the whole system? Well, you may not want to change the whole system anyhow, in the sense that you want you don't want to undo the entire state and society, but but you certainly will become present. And this is one of the things that I've learned. Presence itself can actually be very powerful. Just the fact that when somebody is making a decision, some one of the people, uh, stakeholders around the table, we should really consult with the institute and see what they what their scholars say about it or um, see whether we can actually get a project going. And in the Canadian context, uh, I've seen it in person uh, in terms of synergies established that are pan-university that uh, created alternative venues in migration, citizenship and security matters to um, <clears throat> institutional government offices constantly insisting on synergy, constantly insisting on observation status, constantly asking to be around the table. And by now, they are an essential part of these conversations, but it took 20 years. So that's one way of, of using that position and not to challenge. And going back to Saita, just very, very, um, I think, fair and accurate um, depiction of what happens when you give a, a public statement. I mean, newspapers are dangerous places, especially when you have an institutional profile. It could really be pulled in this way or another. Uh, but interviews are interesting ones because they are not news pieces. They're actually inside pieces. So one of the things I try to do over time is actually if someone asks for a new news piece, I say, let's do an interview or let's do a broadcast. Give me the space. You, that way you can't get the tidbit from me. I will give you the entire context as I see it. It's much more elaborate. It's uh, much more, how shall we say, multi-angled, because that's what we are trained for. We are not ideologues, right? We are not there to do, do more piecing for one or, an, or another party. And, and therefore, you fight to create space for you. You don't do the headline, but you do the interview, or you do the long version. Or you 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 ask for an expert opinion corner, and 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 you hold the right to edit what they're going to publish in advance. 
Um, so, so you always safeguard yourself. But I think we should be out there. As much as we're out there in the classroom, I think we should be out there in the given particular subject areas that we're dealing with and rem remind people that as much as a bureaucrat or a politician, we actually have an opinion that matters that could really affect things. And, and, and not as a tag of war, but as I said, just a sheer presence with honor and pride that, by the way, I'm trained in this for 30 years and I have a global insight. So as a society, you can really benefit from what I might have to say. You may you don't have to take it into account, but at least perhaps you should listen. I mean, in law, there's something called amicus cry, right? It's the expert opinion who is not a party to the, the, the particular case that's taking place. And often judges call for it when the matter relates to a societal interest. And when you're called in for amicus cry, you give a, a, a larger opinion, a, a broader perspective, because you're not a party to that specific conflict, but you think that conflict really relates to larger social issues. You're given that space in the house of court just to express what you know. And, and I would think that that's a good model for us all, to, to create that space for us to be visible, whether people listen, not listen, use it for their decisions, it doesn't matter, but our voice is there. Because otherwise, we've got one very valuable venue, which is our students and the university platform, but by and large, education is parcelized. So what's happening in the nearest university, people may not know, just like, you know, 100 kilometers from you. And if they knew, they would have benefited so much. So that's another um, <clears throat> future projection to establish regional synergies, to establish uh, research bodies where people from different institutions actually come together and share ideas, not to do anything, not to do anything. I mean, it's not like a instrumentalization of knowledge, but just so that you are aware of what's happening there within the Cypriot, Northern Cypriot landscape, for instance. Um, I know individually you invite uh, colleagues, um, but it's an individual effort. What if there's actually a network, right? What if there's actually a, a more of an exchange, a flow, a continuation, where you actually know the projects, uh, you actually know um, <clears throat> some of the growing concerns. And, and one might say, we are um, increasingly witnessing the politicization of academia, right? So we've, our workloads are so heavy. Um, there's a certain limit as to how much we can deal with things. Um, but the trick with these kinds of synergies is that they are not too frequent, and yet they're continuous. So let's say once a month, once a term, but it's there. It's not a one-time thing, but it's actually a rotating thing. Um, and eventually creating a little budget from the university or from the Ministry of Education for that kind of synergy. Um, just so that we can read and we can think and we can write and we're not confined to the four walls of the classroom for what we're doing. Because I don't think we should be. I think the society needs us as much as we need them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajam. Um, so, it, it has always been a pleasure, actually, to, to host you, to welcome you uh, in our activities. And we all hope that with Sayutaja and Direnchaja, that we will also going to uh, have a more broader, uh, actually, collaboration with you, hopefully in 2021. Um, so there is also a question from our master's student, Darius. How can we have access to Professor Jennifer's works and written articles. I can also, uh, with my colleagues, ha help you to have access. Uh, definitely, uh, we, will, we will guide you in that respect. So once again, thank you very much and hope to see you in another event. Thank you. Well,